Singapore is tiny, the size of New York City, only with fewer people living there. China is a behemoth in every way, including economy and military. Yet to actually go and conquer a faraway overseas country, China would need quite a bit of military power projection. Does it have what it takes? Could it conquer Singapore within a year? Or would the Singapore's well-funded armed forces keep the city free? On to our video, the first part in a two-part series as the topic is quite complex. The Chinese military has 2 million people in active service. Singapore has 40 times fewer. But Singapore is over 1400 miles away from mainland China by sea. In our scenario, third-party countries are not to interfere and are not to be used for travel. The exception to that will be the Singapore Strait Waterway. It will be considered a special sea territory where neither Malaysia nor Indonesia will try to stop the Chinese fleet. So China would have to bring in their soldiers and weapons via routes not touching other countries. That complicates matters greatly for China, because Chinese ships and planes actually capable of traversing set distances and deploying so far away from home are not that numerous. Let's just take their air forces as an example. Nominally, China has almost 2200 combat aircraft. Singapore has 22 times fewer, which is actually a formidable number, considering just how small Singapore is. Even to island of Hainan, it's still 1300 miles, though China has those newly constructed island air bases in the South China Sea. For all purposes, they're Chinese-held territories, surely to be used in a war. Fiery Cross Reef Base is closest, just outside the practical combat radius of the biggest fighters China has when unrefueled. Those three bases would be absolutely crucial in a war like this. Now, save for several dozen J-20 stealth fighters that China has, its J-16 flankers and J-10s are the best and longest legged planes available to it. A two-seater flanker has a ferry range of 3000 kilometers, flying high up, straight and with no real weapons load. The combat radius is a third of that figure, due to the return trip, weapons load and flight profile, so roughly 600 to 700 miles. So jets taking off from the island bases would need a bit of in-flight refueling. But if taking off from Hainan, fighters would basically need two big top-ups, one on the way there and another one on the way back. The Chinese in-flight refueling fleet is still limited compared to the size of the entire Chinese Air Force. The H-6 base tankers offer limited fuel volume, illusions are not plentiful, and the domestic Y-20 tanker variant entered service only a few months ago. Any sort of longer stay over Singapore, for example to search for targets of opportunity or to provide more continuous air cover, would require additional fuel. Crucially, tankers would also use fuel to simply get to the refueling locations. Illusions operating from South China Sea bases would likely be able to unload only two-thirds of their fuel load. The Y-20 tankers should do better. All that means there would be some 20 tanker planes eating up into available parking space on those bases. Alongside those, and fighters, there'd be other aircraft operating as well. Maritime patrol, aerial early warning, elint, and drones. But there is ample apron space there. So even with a dozen large planes, there should be room for several dozen fighter jets on each island. But even if three quarters of the Chinese tanker fleet could somehow be made available 24-7, it's unlikely China would be able to send in more than 110 or so flanker-sized planes from those island bases, per single wave. In reality, actual force composition would likely be a bit different. A few dozen J-20s would be used as fighter escorts. Those might need a bit less fuel as they hold an ample fuel volume. Several dozen J-16 multi-role planes would most likely serve as strike platforms, and 20 or so flankers might at times be replaced by two times as many J-10s, also for fighter escort. Going piecemeal throughout the day might give China better coverage and constantly harass Singapore, but it would also mean the Chinese planes might be outnumbered and overpowered. So in all likelihood, China would settle on performing several big strike packages per day. Of course, China does have two functioning aircraft carriers. The Chinese fleet of carrier-borne fighters numbers around 50 airframes. So what would those Chinese planes come up against? It's not just the Singaporean fighters. 
though those are pretty lethal. The F-15 variants are among the most modern ones out there. Almost all of the F-16s are further modernized Block 52s, with such features as helmet-mounted sights and anti-ship missile carriage added. Oh, and this scenario will assume enough time for Singapore to bring back all its aircraft stationed abroad for training. There are also four planes with Israeli-made aerial early warning radars in service with Singapore. Even if Chinese planes fly a low approach, it might not hide them from those radars, as long as the planes are operational. There are also numerous other ground and ship-based radars and, of course, ground and ship-based SAM systems. Singapore has long-range SAMs using the Astra missile. Most of those are based on their frigates, which would most likely be used as air defense stations and not risked out into the sea. The second layer of defenses is made up of various ground and ship-based systems using various missiles. The third layer is made of shorter systems, which lack the altitude reach to be really useful, except against incoming missiles and very low flying aircraft. There are of course hundreds of additional shoulder-launched missiles, but those aren't directly aided by radar systems. The opening of a Chinese attack would have to involve a very liberal use of standoff missiles, trying to neutralize at least part of those defenses and keep most of the enemy's planes trapped on the ground. But ships are quite mobile, as are most ground-based SAM systems. There would have to be a lot of cruise missile expended before some hits occur. It is not known whether Chinese cruise missiles can be retargeted in flight. Fighters on the ground would be hard to target in time, as they would likely be moved around frequently. Targeting fixed locations like hardened shelters would be possible though, as Singapore is quite tiny and there isn't space for countless shelters. It is unknown if the Chinese cruise missiles feature bunker-busting warheads. Simply littering the entire base area with smaller submunitions would also work, due to finite airbase space. Whatever is not under a shelter would likely get damaged that way. But the airstrips would definitely get cratered, made unfit for aircraft operations. Even though a good repair crew can mend a crater within hours, a near constant trickle of missiles could keep most of Singapore's near 20 airstrips, highway strips and taxiways fit for planes closed. Larger planes such as AWACS and tankers, which are harder to hide and protect, might be destroyed outright on the ground. China does possess a sizable number of cruise missiles. Every missile shown could be launched either by a naval vessel, an aircraft or a truck stationed on one of the South China Sea bases. But there are potentially thousands of additional fighter-launched tactical standoff weapons China would use. Exact figures are impossible to come by, so these are mere projections, based on other countries' air force missile to plane ratios. Would Singapore try to go after Chinese bases? Well, it would likely stay put. While it does have some standoff weapons, the fact is, those would be unlikely to reach any Chinese bases. Rather, China would use its big navy and ample aerial early warning aircraft fleet to monitor all the approaches to the SCS islands, and simply use its numbers, now operating closer to their bases, to intercept the potential attackers. And China does have a lot of ships with capable anti-air systems. It is very unlikely a Singaporean attack on Chinese island bases would succeed without heavy losses, and whatever damage such an attack would do would be repaired, with the destroyed planes replaced. Those Chinese numbers would help even during the offensive over Singapore. Even if one assumes that no Singaporean SAM platform gets destroyed, the overall stocks of missiles are finite. And even if those manage to down 100 or 200 Chinese planes, China would still have plenty more to send to those island bases of theirs as replacements. So the whole first half of the war would go something like this. Perhaps some cruise missile salvos in the initial hours would happen. Days of Chinese mobilizing their navy and air force, securing those SCS island bases. Then days of building up the air force assets on those bases. After a week or so, China would likely start striking at Singapore in big waves on a daily basis. Perhaps it would take a bit longer for both Chinese aircraft carriers to get deployed near Singapore. A week of standoff weapon strikes would whittle down Singaporean Air Force numbers in the air. After all that, Singapore's defenses would be low on usable runways, usable fighter jets and usable SAM systems with enough remaining missiles. Chinese Air Forces, after possibly a hundred or more planes lost, would eventually even start to overfly Singapore. 
recon missions and airstrikes with cheaper bombs would be plentiful. Further Chinese losses would happen, but by then whatever planes Singapore could launch would be grossly outnumbered. And whatever SAM launches would happen would greatly endanger those SAM locations afterwards. Naval battles would begin in earnest as well, as China would be taking their air defense destroyers and aircraft carriers closer to Singapore, perhaps just a few hundred miles away. Going out to the open sea at that stage would still be suicide for whatever surface ships Singapore would still have remaining. Most of the fighting would be done by Singapore's submarines and perhaps an occasional airstrike. If enough fighter jets and Fokker maritime patrol planes can take to the air in between the Chinese air attacks. But given the sheer numbers of Chinese ships with layered air defenses, the number of missiles actually hitting Chinese ships would be minimal. The four submarines Singapore has would be more dangerous, but those are quite small subs made for coastal regions. The two Archer-class subs with their very quiet drives would present the greatest risk to the Chinese. Still, being slow, they would need to cross a hundred or more miles to get to firing distance, through a sea swarming with Chinese submarines and a sea constantly overflown by Chinese aerial anti-submarine assets. Even if a submarine managed to get to torpedo launching distance, it would likely be against a forward positioned ship, like a frigate. A launching a torpedo would increase the chances of the Chinese locating it and neutralizing it afterwards. Chinese submarines are ocean going and would serve as the forward ring of Chinese power projection, screening for Singapore's subs and surface ships. Even if China loses a few submarines, it would be a drop in the ocean. Singapore's shores would eventually get threatened. Chinese soldiers would embark on Singapore's shores. But more about that in our concluding video, where China assaults the Singaporean island themselves. The video is to be released next Wednesday. Before we go, allow us a few more details on the Conflict of Nations game. It's a free online PvP strategy game of modern global warfare. There are different maps to play on, including the Cold War, World War III and others. Maps contain countless regions within real countries, and most countries are playable factions. In the game you can build up your army using many different units, tanks, jets, even nuke subs. You control diplomacy and conspire with other players, deciding who to ally with, and research new abilities all the way up to the nukes. Battles can be epic while you try to take over the world. So click that link in the description to get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. The offer is available for 30 days only, so don't lose time. Choose your country and lead it to victory. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.